All right. So um, we'll introduce ourselves. So I'm Jessica Satcher. I'm one of the co-founders of Phage Directory. And I did a PhD in phage biology from University of Alberta. I finished that two years ago. And I studied Campylobacter, jejuni phages, and glycosylation, and how phages interact with their host sugars. So that's where I got interested in phages. And I met Jan, who you'll meet, um, partway through my degree, I guess near the end. And he uh, is really the reason Phage Directory started. And that's why we're working on it now. And now we both work on this full time. Um, and really it all started, you'll hear a little bit more about it, but with Twitter and finding that people were trying to use Twitter to find life-saving phages. And this really was compelling to me as a researcher who had these phages, but that there was still people dying and they could be using them. So that was kind of the impetus. So I will let Jan introduce himself now. Okay, hi, my name is Jan. I'm the other co-founder, the, the silent co-founder of Phage Directory. <laughs> um, I have a non, I don't have a biology background at all. I come from the world of computer science and human computer interaction, which means that I, what I do is essentially I write code and design software and apps and mechanisms that make computers, anything from apps to websites, uh, much easier to use. So when I first met Jess, we were scrolling through Twitter and essentially seeing that people are requesting phages on Twitter to save people. And we were like, this is, this is really bad. Twitter is supposed to be used for, I don't know, like political dissent, not for finding life-saving drugs. So, so immediately we just jumped on it and said, let's build a side project. Let's just like build phage directory. We came up with that name in about three minutes. We're like, what do we call it? It's called phage directory. And let's get this up as soon as we can so that people can find phages for their patients. And so that, that was like a split decision creation of like the entire phage directory. And I thought he was joking when he said like, let's create a website and get people to sign up and they'll list themselves if they have phages. And I was like, oh yeah, that would be cool. And I thought we were just brainstorming, you know, for fun. And then the next night, or I think the same night, he like messaged me and said, so the domain phage.directory is available. So I'm going to buy it. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, but I was, I don't know, used to the academic world and we do brainstorming all the time and then we think things through and we do not start the project that night. Uh, so, you know, that was getting into more of what Jan's used to in that culture and it's, it's a lot of fun. So before we move on to continuing with Phage Directory, we need to introduce Stephanie Lynch, who let's, can we make her, face be the center i'm going to spotlight her yeah. <laughs> look no, at her to do that. <laughs> this is stephanie <laughs> <laughs> and stephanie is one of our volunteers and so she approached me out of the blue saying do you need any help with faves and organizing because i would love to help and so ever since she has been playing a major role in what we're building this into and she's like this is her Zoom account. That's how intimately involved <laughs> she is with this. She trusts us. And so, um, how do I unspotlight you? I'll let you go yes, back to the you. background. <laughs> Are you back? Okay. Um, but we're really excited to have Stephanie helping us. And she, uh, well, we met her because she was a writer for us in our Capsid and Tail newsletter. And she wrote about her research on um, phage therapy for dogs. And so that was a really popular issue. Um, we always kind of go and check which ones are the really popular ones. It turns out everyone loves puppies. So yeah, so that's where we met Stephanie and we're super excited to have her on board with this. So uh, yeah, we can go forward and I think Stephanie is gonna, we're gonna do this structure it like a Q&A. Stephanie will ask us some questions and then please write your questions in the chat and then we're also going to make Stephanie keep track of those and see, but we'll all try to help. Um, and there's not so many people that we can't uh, have people like unmute themselves and ask a question. So we'll give that a try too, if there's um, somebody with questions. So for now, 
we'll just get started. Stephanie, you, you can ask, ask your questions. Yeah. <laughs> I think that sounds really good. Um, and I mean, you kind of already touched on it, but I think one of the questions that I know I was really interested in is, yeah, just pretty much the background of um, phage therapy. Oh, sorry, phage directory. I said that before as well. <laughs> um, phage directory. Um, yeah, and just what's coming up next um, in that sense. Yeah, so oh. we could, yeah. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, we did touch on the background. Started with Twitter. Uh, and really, we started delving in after we made the original website. People started joining it, which little did I know, um, but that was going to be the signal that Jan was waiting for to keep going with this. And there was already, because we started because of Mallory Smith, and she was the patient that they were looking for phages for um, on Twitter, Stephanie Strathy was looking for the phages for her. And we, so we genuinely started this to try to help Mallory. And Jan built the site. Uh, we we kind of started a Twitter account and tried to, you know, I started emailing some phage researchers I knew saying, hey, do you want to list your phages if anybody has phages to share? Because academic research labs were the ones that were the source of these phages for Stephanie trying to help her husband before that. So that's, you know, the best source really because there aren't that many other sources is go straight to the academic labs. Um, and then there was all this media attention and that was because Mallory died that same week. And so that really solidified that there was a really big problem because, you know, she was a candidate for phage therapy. Her doctor was on board. They got the phages ready. Like it was just barely too late for her. So we thought, okay, we're speeding this process up. And then we were interviewed by Stat News and they like this just led to more people joining. So we had this whole list of labs saying, here, these are the phages I have. Um, and I'm willing to help next time there's a patient. Um, and ever since then, so that was in 2017, uh, we have been, the, the central focus has been for us to talk to everyone involved with phages. From researchers, we started there because that's where my network already was. Um, but also doctors who are interested in phages, biotech companies that are working with phages. And we really wanted to understand what are the bottlenecks? Like why is it inefficient to get from phage in the ground or in the sewer to patient treatment? And we know there's, there's lots of steps. As a researcher at the time, I knew, well, I didn't even think we were anywhere close to being ready to use phages to treat patients in like North America where I was. So definitely I knew it was an ambiguous process with lots of steps. So we set out to find out the bottlenecks. And that led us to going around interviewing people and figuring out like, what does it take? How have these patient case treatments gone in the past? Um, what, like, how does regulatory play into this? Like, is this even legal to help with this kind of thing? And we learned all about that. And so now here we are two years later, um, we've been really trying to always keep conversations going ongoing with all these researchers, but we're, we're centering in on a few areas where we can really um, help kind of grease the wheels on this whole process and make it more efficient for a phage to come out of the ground and be useful. So Jan, do you want to talk about the, where we're at now with, because he's from the tech side and he's the one actually building everything and he has lots of tools in mind that he wants to build. Yeah, so, so as you know, we started a while ago, we started almost three years ago, and the reason we haven't started building a lot of products is because I don't have a phage background. So essentially for the last couple of years, we just spent most of our time talking with professors, talking with researchers and students and everyone we can meet who cares about phage to kind of gauge you know, like, where are all the problems? What kind of tools does the entire ecosystem need in order to come up with better research, more research, um, and essentially, like a system, like a, like a systematic approach to support all of the entire phage world. And a lot of people equate us with, you know, phage therapy because that's where we started. But what we really want to do is we want to elevate the entire field by building the tools, like uh, making phages easier to exchange with one another, like making it easier to find phages you need for research from anything from like phage banks to other labs. 
or making it easy for you to like track the phages you use in the lab to like ordering other materials that'll make it, you know, make your research go faster. So like that is the angle we're taking. And so basically what I had to do is catch up on the phage. Like three years ago, I didn't even know what a phage was. Um, now I kind of have an idea, but it's still like a learning process. Um, so, um, so to answer Jess feeder source questions, um, is phage actually only for phages against pathogenic bacterial species, uh, or their interest in any kind of phages with known hosts? So we, like when we first got started, we only, even though we're called phage actually, we only collected the names of the hosts that people say it is would kill, right? Um, because our original intent was to, um, to send those phages to labs or to, to institutes or to hospitals who had patients, right, that needed phages. But now we're building a database that collects information about each person's phage, and the metadata on the phage. So like, like are they lytic? Um, like what is their um, like gem bank accession number? Like, and we're trying to build a system that allows you to collect lots and lots of data around your phage. And the, the bigger idea is to be able to um, essentially build like a Wikipedia of phage, right? Where you can search for any kind of lytic phages that work against um, like E. coli. But also if you're looking for marine phages, like we're gonna have marine phages and like all kinds of other phage. And the idea is to just build like a wiki, right? Like a place to collect information because we don't have a wiki of phages right now, like in the world. So we think that that is a bigger mission than just finding phages for patients, because in the end, it'll trickle down to the patients. Um, and then the other question from Jess, or from Jane Nisley of NIAD is, does phage actually collect any standardized data for compassionate use? Uh, well, we, we started out as a very, um, it's a, it's a process where we learn as we go, and the more we learn, the more we realize that there isn't a lot of standardization, and we've worked with some other teams to figure out how to be standardized. So that's still a process that we're figuring out. But the idea that, uh, like on one side, we want to collect uh, data on a phage, the other side, we want to collect data on, um, like, on how treatment goes, right? And how, like, like how getting treatment to a patient goes and like, what are all the paperwork? Like, what are the outcomes? What are like all this stuff? There's a lot of things to collect. And right now we're still only like a two person team plus Stephanie and a couple other volunteers. So we're like a very bootstrapped homegrown organization, but we have lots of plans in the future. Yeah, and I want to comment on the compassionate use too, because um, the uh, the question from Jane, um, because just to give some clarity around how we currently do these compassionate cases, uh, so we did start right away in 2017, like soon after the we put up our website, there was I think by December, so the next month there was somebody asking us for phages, and um, and we you know, at the point start, we just said, okay, we'll help whoever asks. And we really had to figure out, you know, what kind of data does matter and what kind of data is being collected. Um, but nowadays we have it so that if somebody asks us for a phage, uh, we, first of all, we don't initiate a phage hunt for every case that we hear about. So if it comes from the patient themselves, the first thing we do is to ask them to get their doctor on board. Um, if it comes from a physician who has a patient that's kind of advanced forward, we're at that threshold where the physician is actually aware of what needs to be done in their country and is willing to go through with this. Um, and so that's our main criteria is, is a physician involved. Um, if the physician wants to be but doesn't know how, we connect them with another physician who has already done this and is willing to consult with them. Um, we uh, then the next thing to do is find a, a host lab or a hub lab. So there needs to be a phage research lab that is going to accept the patient strain and accept everyone else's phages and do the testing. Um, that sometimes that's multiple labs. 
depending on the organism, we try to find a lab. Usually these requests do come from a lab that's already been approached by the doctor. So we often don't make that call, but it'll be, you know, say Mikhail Skernik's lab in, in Finland has been one of our, we've talked about the cases we've helped his lab with. Maybe you're here, Mikhail, or someone from your lab. I don't know. But uh, we, get, we get the requests from their lab saying, we, we will test the phages. People can send them here. And then that's kind of how it goes. So we're just helping with one right now that's actually also there with that lab. Um, and what we really do want to do is have these, you know, as Jane mentioned, root of administration, type of phage, infection, pathogen type outcome. Like right now, all that data is being lost. It is probably being collected by somebody in some form, but where is it going? And could we be more efficient about which phages are chosen to, to treat a patient or for whatever company that's working on a phage cocktail? Could they narrow down their search and only invest effort in acquiring the phages that are likely to be good for that use case? I had a quick question and yeah. um, I know there's another one in the chat, but it's kind of on the same realm, I suppose. Um, how quickly from when a patient or a doctor sends out a request for phages, do, do they receive the phages if they do? Yeah. How quick is kind of the turnaround and the process, I suppose? Yeah. Good question. Um, so the fastest, I think, I mean, first of all, to preface this, most of the cases we help with don't end up involving a phage actually being used in the patient. Like there are so many steps and so many possible times at which the, the, the process stops or pauses indefinitely that there's only been a couple of cases where the patient's really been treated. Sometimes the patient dies during the process. Uh, sometimes the patient is, you know, gets healthier and they don't qualify anymore for compassionate use care. Like their antibiotics start working. So then the phage, you know, they don't get the phage. Um, but in the case that I think the only case that we actually have a time frame, it took six weeks from the initial alert. And they were really excited about that because that's pretty short when you consider how many moving parts there are. Um, but still, of course, it's, it's still so much, it's too long for most people. And so the problem right now is most people only qualify for phage therapy if they're sick enough that they have no other option, but they're not so sick that they can't wait six weeks. And that's, that's a short turnaround. So it's, that's kind of the crux of it. Um, so we want to help shrink that time. But of course, when it's, this is essentially a crowdsourced mechanism, right? Like, it's going to take longer, but it's better than nothing is how we see it. But we do want to keep moving toward um, equipping, first of all, equipping those labs that are involved with uh, software that allows them to really easily track which phages have come in, which paperwork goes with which phage, because they'll get hundreds of phages and they'll all have a different MTA associated with them, material transfer agent or uh, agent <laughs> agreement. And, you know, like, can we make the process more efficient in little ways um, the way it is now, but then also can we transform it and make it shorter overall? Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, I was on. just, oh, sorry, you go, Jen. I was going to read the chat out. Um, so okay. there was, it's yeah, like, it's about, about yeah. like, what is the reaction of phage community when we first came up with the idea? I think, uh, yeah, so that's something that we've, we've been very, wary of since we started because we aren't professors and we're not you know as part of these large institutions right so uh, when we set out we decided that we had to be like extremely professional and then we had to like have a lot of these um, ideas figured out in terms of, like what the ecosystem really needs uh, and so that's why we had all these conversations with lots of professors around the world. Uh, like we visited, for example, Andy Miller's on the chat, like we visited his lab and we visited, you know, we visited him in England, we visited lots of different countries and just had these long conversations with them to figure out um, like what are the things that the community of phage researchers need and what can we do to support that need instead of like focusing this around our project because we're 
essentially building this project for the community. It's less about us as a startup or us as like two individuals because we see this being a lot bigger than us. So that um, again, like like for example, this video chat or this video hangout, right? Like uh, Stephanie, like if it wasn't for Stephanie helping us do all of this work, like we would not be here right now doing this video seminar. Like like she has been so helpful getting this all together for us. So like this is much bigger than just, just the two of us. So from that standpoint, yeah, like um, like we're just to to um, I guess we're not professors or anything, but like people really love the idea of what we're doing. Yeah, and it was really uh, surprising that the po the response was so positive in the very first week, and I think that's key to why we went forward. Um, because why would people just sign up their lab on this random website that who knows who these people are? Like we thought if that's true, then maybe there's a lot more people who are interested. Because I thought from my perspective as a researcher at the time, as a PhD student, uh, our lab didn't participate in anything related to therapy, but that's just happened to be because we focus more on molecular biology. But I thought, you know, labs wouldn't, I, I just did not think that they would be on board with sharing their phages for a real per patient's case. I just didn't think that that would happen. So when it did, then that was a big signal for us. Yeah. Okay, there's it some seems, more questions. Cool. Yeah, ahead, I was just going to read, read them out for you. seems like people are very interested in the compassionate cases, which is very cool. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to read them in order, I suppose. So sure. um, what about, oh, so Gail is asking, what about barriers to shipping um, phages between countries? Import, export rules are very different from place to place. Yes. So we ran into yeah. this very early. I would say the, this is the first thing we ran into. And uh, it really has involved the whole time just like ad hoc figuring this out. So the first, I, I don't remember which one was first, but it involved us going, I think it was France. Okay, so France, um, this person who wants to ship from Belgium to France, do we know anyone who's already done that? We asked Stephanie Strathdy who had helped organize stage therapy for her husband. And she said, yeah, we, this is how we did it because Jean-Paul Pernay from Belgium sent us stage and he did it this way. Um, and so then we would just relay that. So instead of coming at it from like top down, like let's go through and find shipping, like first from every country, we have approached it as, okay, when there's a country that has a question, that's when we look it up. <laughs> and we're, we're saving that information. Eventually we wanna have that more available so people could just come and look it up and, and really get like, cause there's all these secret tips and tricks, you know, DHL is like really good for this country to this country and, or definitely use FedEx for this. Like um, we've come to, we're trying to just collect this and be a fly on the wall as these emails go back and forth. Um, and keep going, okay, yeah, like FedEx is the one, if you're going Finland to Nigeria or back, like this is a real, <laughs> that's what they're using. And so how helpful would it be to actually have that information? So yeah, we're, that's kind of how we're dealing with it. Cause you're right, Gail, it's like, it's different for everyone. And, um, and then when it comes to agreements, like who's allowed to receive these different shipments, like receiving a pathogen from a hospital. Like if your lab has never done that uh, versus if you already receive pseudomonas isolates all the time, that, that helps us. Like we ask those kind of questions to figure out who should be the lab that receives the strain. And if a lab has never received that strain, usually they're not trying to do it the first time with this. Um, we, we've so far been lucky to have people kind of know what their own lab is good at and capable of and comfortable with. And we just kind of take the lead from there, but yeah, it will it will become more structured as we run into more roadblocks. On the other side is also tech chancellor offices. Sometimes um, they they care about where their essentially their property is going, and sometimes they're also worried about like are they going to be liable if their phages get used in treatment. And the other side is uh, Nagoya Protocol, which is something that keeps being brought up all the time, but we haven't we haven't run into any kind of Nagoya protocol enforcement yet. So we don't really know exactly who enforces that or how exactly that works, but we still want to stay within the protocol rules and make sure that anything that gets shipped from one country to another is legal in terms of that protocol. Yeah. 
Yeah. So basically like you could say that the theme of everything we're doing is about like, I picture us like Play-Doh, like sticking all these different little pieces together and going, Oh, there's this, like, let's, let's draw that in. The, the knowledge is out there in the community. It's all dispersed. It's very geographically spread. There's labs in the Philippines. There's labs in Nepal. There's like labs in Nigeria. They're all doing phage work and they all have their little tips and tricks. And this goes from logistics of shipping phages and doing phage therapy, but research too. So if we can just like stick everything, like be the observer and make it really easy for people to find us and really easy for them to contribute what they know, then the will kind of organize it but it's still like a very crowdsourced body of knowledge where I think that's the benefit of us coming from the bottom up instead of the top down is that we're not going to be introducing like we think it should be this way. We are only going to introduce things that have bubbled up from hearing about it from what's really working. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next question we have, or oh, if you're okay to yeah. move ahead. Yeah. So the next one we have is from um, Madha. So how many requests have you got so far and how many requests were within reach or possible? That, that I will look into the numbers and I'll share that because that's a, a, we haven't gone through the numbers and shared them in a little while. It's probably time for us to do that in Caps and Tail. But on a ballpark, I would say we've helped with about 15 I think different emergency cases and those are that means like they had the physician involved and we went ahead with them so uh, we get a lot more requests than that um, but it's not you know it's not hundreds or thousands of requests like when we don't get that many requests from patients compared to probably what like phage biotech companies get um, but we're starting to hear from people we also have a of an FAQ about phage therapy on our site. And so usually I think people read that and that really diverts them away from coming to us unless they have the exact thing that we need, which is their physician is ready to do it. That's still a low number. So maybe there's three times as many people who ask or four times that than ones that we can actually help. But that's, that's a, a guess. <laughs> yeah, and then so how many, oh, sorry. No, you go. In terms of how many were, were actually possible, um, one of the things that contributes to whether they're possible, like from the patient's standpoint, whether they're getting the phage or not, is the host. Uh, so there's some hosts that we just, we know as soon as we hear about them that we're not going to be able to find a phage. Like we still try. Burkholderia, for instance, very few um, labs working on that mycobacterium. Uh, Sometimes there's one lab basically the Hatful lab that we go to because if someone's going to have a phage against mycobacterium, it'll be them. Um, but there's other ones where we, we just get crickets when we, we send an alert out to all of our subscribers. We'll say, do you have mycoplasma phages? Nobody does. Uh, if anybody does or knows anybody who does, please tell them to email me because we have had several patients who want that. Um, and yeah, so that comes into play when you think about which ones are within reach. But Pseudomonas E. coli will get dozens of labs in, within hours saying, yeah, we, we have 100 pages, we have 10, we have eight, we have 300. So it could be really, really within reach. And they always find something. Like the case we're doing now, for those hosts, the case we're helping with now, um, it is a, a E. coli phage, yeah, and there's been, yeah, we have some positive hits and the Pseudomonas one, the six week one that was in Australia and they had lots of positive hits. Cool, I wanna, I wanna cover Ermi's question really quick because she has to leave soon. Um, she was asking a question about uh, what are we doing in terms of protocols and genome annotations because the younger research community needs to exchange notes on them as annotation tools particularly are evolving fast. Yeah, so this goes into our 2020 and probably our 2021 mission of building tools. Um, so I don't know if you guys have read it, but a few weeks ago on Caps and Tail, we talked about how we're going to record the phage schema. So what are all the data we're tracking about a phage or what is all the data that people need to know about a phage in order to advance their research? Um, so once we have that part together, uh, we're going to attach a protocol schema of how people work on the phage, and we're going to attach 
um, a genome annotation system, which we actually, <laughs> we tried to launch it last year to kind of lukewarm reception. So we've been building, we've been holding on to that, uh, what we've built uh, late last year, which is um, uh, phase directory insights. And we're, we're tying that together with the phage schema so that in the future, when people are adding data to their phages, um, they will be um, uploaded and assigned a DOI, just like, um, just like protocols IOW. So the idea is that in the future, once you're working on your phage and you want to share your phage with the rest of the community, you can attach a DOI if you want and the rest of the community can see what are all the protocols you work on your phages and what are the details of your phages. So our internal analogy for this, um, our nickname for this is phage decks, kind of like a Pokedex if you play with a Pokemon. Um, essentially a Pokedex is each, um, in Pokemon you're trying to collect all the Pokemon, right? Like also I don't play Pokemon, I've only played Pokemon Go, which is apparently not the real Pokemon. But in Pokemon you're trying to collect all the Pokemon because they all have different characteristics. We're trying to build a Pokedex of Phage where we're trying to collect all the information we can from the community about each Pokemon and including like what are the characteristics, what are the kill, or what are their host ranges, um, and so on. Yes, and to also add to that in response to your question, Ermi, um, related to protocols, genome annotations, like this also we wanted to do genome announcements. That's another extension is once there are um, like people have a place to input their data about the phage, we'll also be giving a place for a narrative about that, similar to as you would have genome announcements, microbiology resource announcements, where you just have a, a quick 500 word summary of what's going on. People, especially, that's such a great opportunity for undergrad students, um, but also anyone who does this, all this preliminary work on your phage, uh, but then you know it takes years to get like some interesting molecular story about it that's unique. But you know you should really have a place that uh, you can put a phage-specific narrative report about that phage that's still characterization-based. You know it's not groundbreaking necessarily. It's it's groundbreaking for us when you think about the whole community should consider it that way because as we collect all this data together and like line it up in a way that it all can be compared. Uh, yeah, the narrative is nice, but the, the real power of it is that it's all done in the same way and the back end is, is collecting everything um, in a standardized way. So genome reports and genome announcements for students is another future direction. Yeah, yeah. And we've talked to NCBI about this too, and they're really excited about what we're doing because what we're doing, it's slightly outside of the scope of what they're supposed to be doing. So they're, they can't do what we're doing, but they're really happy that we're doing this with them. Um, like once they have the system up and running, like they would like to share their resources with us in terms of like we can start running other tools, like we can be running Blast and other kinds of tools on top of our database using NCBI's um, API and their servers. So that'll be, by that point, it'll be really ex exciting because then we can start running bioinformatics on our data as part of our database. Oh yeah, Very I'm seeing cool. some people saying the genome announcement sounds like a great idea. That's good because this is actually, yeah, and you mentioned the fee, Ermi, and like this was one of our central reasons we wanted to bring this in is that it right now costs almost a thousand dollars or something to post 500 words about your gene, like that's ridiculous. And if, and those things, they're not necessarily peer reviewed anyway in the same way, but regardless of that, like there's nothing stopping us from implementing peer review of these things. We have yeah. the, the community is with us and that's so exciting. And so we can like, I think it was lukewarm last summer when we presented this at Evergreen, people were going, hmm, well, there's already genome announcements, but some people were really excited. So it's, this is our whole strategy is just waiting until there's the impetus from the community and then we're going to run with what we're, we're feeling from everybody. And what, like once it's, it's good to see that people are thinking the genome announcements, like a free or very cheap genome yeah. announcement, like a hundred dollars or less, that kind of thing. Yeah. But that's done in a really high quality way 
it's if that's something that's important to you and for your students like letting us know think of us like your political representatives <laughs> just letting us know that is going to help us prioritize because our efforts are we can't do everything we want that's like the most annoying part. 